Welcome to the Visual Storytelling Podcast. My name is Fred Ranger, and I'm so happy that you're joining us this week for another inspirational conversation. Oh boy, this week we have a very, very, I'll throw one in there, an extra one, very special guest. <laughs> His name is Matt Day. Yes, the Matt Day that you love you know, watching on YouTube and seeing his books and all of his photography, his creativity. Uh, Matt is a photographer who's documenting life in Chillicothe, I hope I said it right, in Ohio. And he's also sharing the process along the way in, uh, at, over at his very popular YouTube channel. So Matt, first off, welcome to the show. Thank you, Fred, for having me. It's uh, it's a pleasure to be here. And yeah, you nailed the pronunciation of Chillicothe just perfectly. <laughs> and thanks for helping me uh, practice it right before the show. <laughs> um, Matt, it's, it's, it's been a long time um, since I wanted to chat with you. And finally, we're sitting down. I've uh, been a big fan, of course, of, of your YouTube channel. I've actually, you know, had a bit of a like an itch because of you over the years and uh, ended up with an M6 and an M10 and so on. But um, for the, the few people who, who don't know you, which I, I, I hope is not a lot of people because most of the listeners here uh, probably know you, but can you tell us a bit more about uh, you and what brought you to photography in, in the first place? Yeah, of course. Uh, I appreciate that. And, um, you know, it's, it's something I've heard pretty often over the years of people you know, saying, uh, one, uh, thank you for bringing the Leica cameras to my attention, but then also uh, the significant other is usually not so happy that I've brought <laughs> Leica cameras to their attention. Um, yeah, I, I've been a photographer for going on uh, close to two decades now. I've been just taking a camera with me pretty much everywhere. And Uh, it started through um, a family member giving me a camera when my brother was in the hospital and he uh, went through an accident and it's sort of a long story. I can try to, you know, give it sort of the, the elevator pitch. Basically, um, he was in an accident that left him uh, paralyzed. And while he was in the hospital for a few months, I was just sort of uh, backpacking, you know, back and forth between different family members and friends' houses. Um, that way I could still get to and from school. I was only 13 at the time. So uh, while he was in Columbus, about an hour north of us here in Ohio, uh, he was in the hospital and my parents were, you know, staying there. My mom was staying there around the clock and my dad was kind of going back and forth from Chillicothe to Columbus. And I was, uh, you know, going up there a few times a week to see him, but then also doing, you know, school and, and, uh, just kind of bouncing back and forth. And so, uh, my aunt and uncle, they brought me a camera, uh, when they were there to visit. And it was sort of with the idea of, you know, give your parents a way to sort of keep up with you. Um, it was one of the early, uh, Kodak Easy Share cameras. I think it had a, a whopping three or four megapixels at the time. And, nice. uh, you know, this was, uh, this was 2004 in April of 2004. So he, uh, gave me the camera with sort of this idea of, you know, have photos that I can print off and bring to my family and, and share with them, but also, uh, sort of documenting my brother's, you know, time and recovery through the hospital and then coming home and, uh, just that whole kind of season really. And, um, it, it was something that cameras for me were always fascinating. Uh, before photography, I already had a little, um, hi eight Sony Handycam that I was constantly just filming anything and everything with my friends. Uh, you know, we would do, you know, jackass was highly popular at the time and I was in middle school. So go figure there. Uh, <laughs> a lot of skateboard you know, it, tricks. It, I hope. Uh, yes. Yes. Skateboarding as well. <laughs> skateboarding came into my life that same, uh, that same time within a month of getting my first camera, I also got my first skateboard. And so naturally the camera and the skateboard just, uh, they, they've, always gone hand in hand, whether it be, you know, photography or a video camera as well. And so, uh, I always had an interest in video cameras in general, um, taking my, my parents Polaroid camera and taking photos with that and disposable cameras on any trip or school field trip, anything at all. I was just always fascinated by the camera, but never saw it as 
um, something to pursue. I think I was just too young to see anything as, you know, something I would want to get into. It was just, I naturally was interested in photography at the time and, uh, uh, or just, you know, using the camera in any way. And so, uh, in that period, I kind of just always kept the camera with me. And I think maybe not necessarily intentionally, um, but just naturally it became sort of my main focus and uh, even a way for me to almost not necessarily disconnect, but it was like a way for me to, to focus on something else in a time where things were very uncertain and there was a lot of ups and downs. And uh, mentally at the time, it was like, I just kind of stayed behind the camera and and i let the camera be um almost like this this thing in front of me you know kind that, of a filter uh, or like yeah yeah sort of a filter um a shield in a way i think you know um at the time of course i just you know i i didn't think of it that way but in hindsight as i've gone and looked back that's that's the way it felt was just sort of a way for me to um to just sort of navigate everything. It was the camera kind of always led the way and um, through, you know, past that. And then again, getting more and more into skateboarding, the camera became even more important. And then uh, friends starting bands and always, you know, being in the van with them, going to shows and taking photos at the shows while they're playing, taking photos, you know, out back loading in and in the van um, just sort of always wanting to document, uh, no matter what it was I was doing. That was essentially like an, my first sort of, uh, you know, guidance I got with the camera. You know, it was to sort of document things and, and you know, sort of build that record. And um, just naturally through my own interest, um, that just became sort of the obsession from the beginning. And um yeah, over time, you know, fast forward many years and, and uh, you know, I've worn a, a lot of different hats as a photographer. And uh, nowadays it's uh, it's unbelievable to me it's still. I, I still have a hard time wrapping my mind around, you know, YouTube and, and sharing my work with such a, a, a wide variety of people all over the world where for many years I never shared any of my pictures i didn't see the need to to do that it was just it was always what i did for me and and for the people in my in my life where i can say hey here's you know here are photos of the show you guys played or here are photos at whatever family function i was at i just using the camera was a way for me i think to feel like i had a place and and sort of a a reason an excuse to be to be present and to to feel like I was contributing something, I think. And, uh, yeah, all, all these, all these years later, it's, it's still sort of, uh, serving that purpose for me. And, and that's definitely something I've, uh, noticed, uh, following you for all those years is that you've always been a very genuine and honest type of person who doesn't mind sharing the struggle, how hard it can be to, to be a creative person you know, people always see, you know, Instagram and so on and so forth and the end result. But uh, you, you did mention on your website that you share the process along the way and the process is not always pretty. So this is one right. thing that I really, really appreciate about you is that you're kind of a, a voice, uh, a reassuring voice because you're like, hey, I can relate to this guy. I'm also going through a tough time. I'm also dealing with, I don't know, mental health and stuff like that. Um and guess what? Photographers are just like anybody else or YouTubers for that matter, are just like anybody else with struggles. And, and, and it's a process. It's a journey. So I yeah. really appreciate people like you who are sharing that side of the story, too, and the nice photos and the nice books and all the great stuff that comes with being a creative photographer. So so thank you for that. <laughs> yeah, no, I, I appreciate you saying that. It's um, I've since I was a kid before photography, before my brother's accident and everything, I was always uh, just a, a really anxious kid um, from as early as I can remember, just riddled with anxiety. And, and so as I kind of got older and especially through the YouTube channel, that was never um, 
at, at first, you know, if you go back to the early videos, I didn't even share any pictures at all in the, in the first videos because I thought who would really want to see any of my pictures. It doesn't, that's, didn't that's you have not, like I was a just, GoPro and that's it or something like that? You were just yeah, wandering yeah. around I with a GoPro. I <laughs> sat by the window and set the GoPro up. Yeah. And I'm like, here's how this camera works. So if you happen to be on eBay like me and you like old cameras, here's, you know, here's how you load the film. Here are the batteries it takes and so on. Um, that, that was all just born out of this, uh, sort of wanting to fill the void where I would be looking into older cameras. You know, I've always been interested in using film, um, from, you know, being a kid and using my parents' cameras, which were all film, but then, you know, getting more and more into photography and all the different kinds of film cameras. Um, you know, once when I was 15, uh, kind of really seeing photography as something I wanted to learn and actually sort of develop a, a craft with it. Um, that was when I bought my first, uh, my first camera that I chose, which was a, a 35 millimeter, an old Minolta XGM and, um, which my son now uses, which is really cool. Um, nice. but it's, it's, uh, it, it's just always been a part of, you know, my interest in photography. I've always just loved that process. And so wanting to just give the information out there for other people, because when I would look online, um, you know, I started the channel in 2014. Um, so yeah, I think, yeah, 2014. It's hard to remember sometimes. <laughs> it goes fast. Uh, <laughs> it's it it was like you know i would find old pdfs of the the user manual occasionally when i would google you know information on a camera but i couldn't see anything from a more practical or modern take on the camera like here's where you can actually find the camera and here are the parts that are you know relatively easy to find for it and here are the lenses that aren't as common and just trying to give a more you know updated look at the camera but it was never meant to be anything about me or my process necessarily or to to your point anything about what makes me me as a person not just my photography and the pictures yeah. and the more that you know youtube i i kind of grew to understand how what that kind of reach is really like you know that that was really shocking to me when i would start getting messages from people all over the world and i'm thinking this is just this is unbelievable i i could have never imagined something like that and so the more i talked to people the more i realized that's really what matters it's it's you know i i could get messages from a photographer who i really admire and they could say something about my work and that could be, you know, an incredible feeling, but knowing regardless if I've ever seen this person's work or not, hearing from people all over the world who have gone through similar things, who have struggled with similar things, um, it, it really helped me realize the importance of sharing things like that, even when it's not, you know, fun or, uh, you know, the pretty stuff. And <laughs> there for a few years, it was like, there was a lot of not pretty stuff that, you know, tragedies and things that were happening, um, even with my own health. And so just through, I think the, the, the habit of that and, and wanting to, to share that sort of thing, it inevitably, I think helped me a lot just in, you know, my own experiences, knowing there are other people and other, you know, it's sort of a two-sided thing. And so I, to your point, I would hear people say, you know, oh, this is, this is comforting because I thought I was the only person struggling with this. And, you know, even in my head, I would still have that same exact thing. So when I would get a message, I'm like, okay, cool. It's, it's not just me that's, that's struggling with this <laughs> or, alone, or going yeah. through something. So, um, yeah, it's, it's not always the, the easy thing or, necessarily what i would want to share at times um at least just in the moment because it's things that i me personally i like to kind of keep things in and to myself and um you know turning the camera towards myself has has really helped me kind of step out of that more than i think i would have otherwise mm. and that's a very powerful message because to your point you you might consider yourself a bit more on the introvert side and not yeah. somebody who wants to share about his personal life Yet it actually has helped you go through difficult times knowing that there were other people going through the same thing or just the sheer power of the community, right? Just somebody yeah. telling you, hey, I'm in Denmark. 
but I'm rooting for you. I'm in your corner. Don't don't give up. You know, like it's, 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 people underestimate. You know, there's such a bad rep for YouTube comments, and you and I have, and you more than me, but you and I have had a fair share of like <laughs> ridiculous comments and and mean comments, and they're part of the game. But I think the other side is, you know, there's it's worth it's worth playing the game because there's so many good things also that come out. The sure fact that we're talking today on this podcast is a right. proof of that. We, if it wasn't for for the internet, for YouTube, for Instagram, whatever, we we I, I would not have known you, and you would be in chili coffee. I, I'd like to pronounce it <laughs> multiple times during the, the, the you're, podcast. You're doing it. That's, yeah, practice makes perfect. <laughs> and I would be in Montreal, Canada. And we would live our life. So, so I think for me, that's very very uh, powerful uh, message. Speaking of of chili coffee <laughs> i think i'll do a i'll do a little uh sound effect and then i'll, I'll plug it you know so then right. the podcast <laughs> uh, but speaking of which um how, how being in a smaller and, and I, I guess a bit more rural community versus being in a large you know new york LA uh, type of city how, how did it help shape the photographer you are today um you know i i think Sometimes it's it's been a blessing and a curse both to my photography and I guess just my overall exposure to everything within photography, whether that be different kinds of photography or or different photographers who maybe I you know otherwise would have been made aware of if I were living in a big city that had you know a, a sense of an art community there and and places where I could meet with other photographers and you know other kinds of artists as well and develop a better language, a better understanding, just overall being exposed to much more than, you know, what I would be exposed to in a small town where I didn't have, you know, a photography course uh, or a class or a club or anything going through school. Um, although I did just hear that the high school I went to, which you know, I, I didn't know a single other photographer all through wow. high school. You know, it was just me. I was the only person I ever saw with a camera at, at that age. And now I, I just recently heard they're adding a photography course next year. So I'm, I'm happy to see my, my former high school is uh, growing and, and, you know, there's, there's a sense of, of interest there and they've started a, a, after school kind of photo club that I want to start, uh, you know, going and being a part of and trying to help as much as I can, whether it be bringing gear that people can try and teaching things or, you know, bagging up a bunch of photo books and bringing them there to have a library day. I mean, I, I, anything I can do to kind of foster that I think would be a really cool thing because had I had something like that, I think in my youth, it would have been, you know, it sounds like a, a buzzword but a, a true game changer yeah. for me to, yeah. to be able to have that kind of access to things that weren't on my radar at all so i my knowledge of photography and my my understanding of different photographers and different approaches all of that has just come through me sort of having to be proactive about finding those things and you know, I'm only going to find what i come across and i'm only going to learn about the things i come across and so a lot of my early influences were all shaped through skateboarding magazines because that was really my only sort of input that I had in the world of photography and seeing, you know, where photos end up and, and the, the purpose of the photos aside from, you know, the family snapshot and, and things like that. The photography for me, it didn't exist other than in places like that. So I could see not only the skateboarding tricks, but the portraits and, and, the way that they would use natural light, the way they would bring artificial light and strobes, you know, a lot of that kind of stuff to freeze any sort of, of movement, you know, like such as skateboarding, you're seeing a lot of artificial light in these broad daylight, completely, you know, different from a studio environment. It's not like you, you see a studio headshot and obviously they have lighting there, but I was seeing these photos of, you know, people using old Hasselblad lenses with high speed sync or not high speed sync, but being able to sync at that speed with leaf shutter lenses. And, and then I, I had to kind of figure out how are they getting this look? This doesn't look like real life. You're seeing, you know, all of the, the different details, not only in the skateboarding, but just the way everything comes together in skateboarding photography is such a different approach that 
I think a, a lot of photographers who grew up with that, they, they take those influences and bring it into, you know, other areas. So for me, you know, wanting to get something like that, I was, you know, I, my, and during high school, I had a, my trunk of my car was full of alien bees lights and a little, you know, heavy, uh, vagabond battery pack. If anyone yep. remembers those and yep. lugging everything out to the the fields and, uh, shooting like band photos and, and setting up sort of the studio on location anywhere and understanding that I needed, you know, a neutral density filter because I didn't have a Hasselblad. I had a little Nikon D60 and, you know, not being able to expose properly. There were all of these different things I just had to learn by a lot of trial and error. And so for me, my, my sort of smaller bubble of, uh, of, of, you know, things I was exposed to, that's really what shaped me more than anything. And I think being in a smaller town, it definitely, you know, I, I was able to kind of focus on when it became a career, there there wasn't as big of a market to necessarily compete with, you know, and I could kind of carve out my own little spot to just, you know, take wedding photos, take band photos, take any whatever, you know, really helped me keep it going. I was open to just chasing all of it. You know, I just wanted to to keep the camera in my hand and um, the idea of it becoming a job was never even an idea until someone asked me to start, you know, taking photos for them. And then it kind of slowly developed into that. Um, but, you know, I think had I grown up in a bigger city, I would have had definitely different influences. I could have taken different career paths. Um, but I think without the even knowledge of that being a thing of, you know, uh, a photography market or other photographers or sort of the comparison game, I think that would be easy, at least for me to fall into had I grown up in a bigger city. Um, it was easy for me to just focus on what I was doing. And as long as I was enjoying, you know, my process of it and I was having fun and I was able to deliver photos to people that they were happy with. Um, that was really all I could ask for, you know? You know what? I think uh, you're 100% right uh, when you talk about such important aspect where you live and what you are influenced by and what you see day in and day out. Uh, the the good thing is that um, you grow through that and then you become you know more um, aware of what pleases you. And I, I want to bring you into the photography aspect of it or the more artistic side of it because your photos... Um, not necessarily I want to I don't want to put a, a label on it but very introspective and also you see the the, the, the use of the space the black and white so um, can you tell me a bit more about the storytelling of your photographs and how you come up with a composition and how does it relate to what you're trying to say and the artist you want to to become yeah it's um, I appreciate that it's it's you know, it's tough for me to, it's still tough for me to, to kind of wrap my mind around what it is I, I want to do with a camera or with my pictures, because for so long, it was all about, you know, being a photographer that can, can contribute for other people that can, can serve a purpose for other people. So whether that be, you know, portraits or, you know, documenting a wedding day, the whole goal is is about that it's i'm providing something for someone else and it as as obviously you want to be happy with your work and you want to feel good about your work and enjoy the process but at the end of the day it's always i want these photos to be what this person wants i want and you know above and beyond that so now i've i've realized over the last couple of years where I've been able to transition fully towards just focusing on my own work and my YouTube channel and still very much figuring all of that out as I go because it was never expected or intended to become anything financial at all, let alone my main full-time kind of focus. And so it's really put me in just sort of a different place altogether that I wasn't necessarily expecting or didn't wrap my mind around until I was in it. And then I realized, well, everything is fair game. I'm 
completely capable, similar to a skateboard. You walk outside, you don't need a coach. You don't need a team. You don't need an opposing player to, you know, you take this skateboard, you go outside and anything you want to do with it, it's yours. You don't need permission. You don't need any of that guidance. And for me with the camera, it's a similar way. I can choose what I photograph. I can choose where and how and, and why. And at the end of the day, who is to say, you know, what it's worth or who it's for or anything. And taking away that sort of uh almost reassurance where you know i'm there on a wedding day and i i'm having this interaction with the couple the people i'm photographing and the guests there and i'm able to feed off of that energy and play off of that energy and so there's there's like this um almost sort of reinforcement going on where i'm like okay i I know what i'm doing and why i'm here and i am doing what i'm here to do you know and it's it's a, a way to kind of keep the wheels going and removing that entirely where it's just me and my camera and it can be whatever I want. The sort of just vast possibilities that are there can be so overwhelming for me now without any sort of like, if, if someone were to give me a shot list and say, I want this, 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 and this, and however you do it, just go do your thing. I, I can. Okay, perfect without that direction and just me up to myself it's a really interesting place because i still want to photograph for myself and i still want it to be work that is first and foremost it's it's me this is what i've loved doing before it was ever a job but as you mentioned earlier you share these things online and it's going all over the world and photography is so open to uh, uh, you know, different interpretations yeah. and so much of it can, can mean and uh, just feel completely different to different people and taking in the feedback on that as well is a whole other side of it because, you know, you want to, uh, for me, at least for my YouTube videos, I want to make videos that people enjoy. And obviously I would hope people would enjoy the pictures and I know that they will be commented on or critiqued or whatever it may be so you kind of have to find this balance of yeah I, I care because it's my job and and it it feels like there's a real connection there when when people do when they get it when they understand but you kind of also have to look at it as like whether they love it or hate it i can't let that dictate everything i can't let that be the guiding factor in it mm -hmm. you know um and i know subconsciously myself at least maybe it's you know just looking back at different pictures and and analyzing it too much again i can be very much in my own head all of the time um so it's it's one of those things where it's like i can see i think at times where i've been as i've just been figuring it out sometimes maybe listening too much or not listening enough to to the feedback to to the comments to whatever it may be uh always trying to just trust naturally in what i'm drawn to taking pictures of that has to be the the driving factor and i'm a pretty simple person you know uh, I've, I've always loved working in just black and white eliminating the color eliminating any of the distraction um sometimes i find at least for my own sake, if I'm shooting with color pictures in mind, the color is going to completely dictate the subject matter, whether or not it's worth photographing anything. Um, I could be drawn to things that I otherwise wouldn't necessarily be interested in shooting, which can be both a good and a bad thing because I want to be spontaneous and I want to let the camera kind of guide me. But at the same time, I also want to make sure I'm not just looking for what people want to see. And that's sort of the fine line you have to kind of play or, or figure out. And I think for me, ultimately, um, you know, I share a lot about just the importance of photography and the way it plays and, and uh, taking a camera with you wherever you are and documenting your life because of what it gets for, you know, what, what I get out of that. That's ultimately the goal is like, I want people to get the same level of fulfillment that I get out of it, but 
I don't necessarily care whether people like the pictures or not. And it's, it's, well, it's at, tough. You know? At the end of the day, I think uh, there is this whole notion. And, and again, being on YouTube puts us in a very weird space because a lot of people are like, oh, you know what? Those are just YouTube photographers. But I, I guess oh, yeah, I, I've heard <laughs> that a million times. Yeah, me, me too. <laughs> and, and, but, but this is where the aspect of, hey, I was a photographer before YouTube. I'm a photographer during YouTube, and I'll be a photographer after YouTube. I don't care Absolutely. about YouTube. Of course, for you, it became your, your your livelihood, and it's important to give value back. But you're in a position where you can actually go back to being a photographer that takes photos for himself. And that's, I will say, a luxury because a lot of people are need to please someone or need to please right. or respond to a brief and you've done it for multiple years and now you're at a point where you know you can shoot for yourself and uh, speaking of shooting for yourself I'm sure when you were shooting weddings and so on you know you were using a uh, color uh, cameras but now you you and your recent videos you talked about going back to 100% monochrome I mean you've shot your M6 with a lot of HP5 and this is all great but you went to the M11 which you know great camera and it does Nice conversions to black and white, but nothing beats, of course, a monochrome sensor, and especially the one that's in the uh, M11 Mono. So, so can you talk a bit more about your almost exclusive use of black and white in your photography? Why is that? It, why does it resonate so much with you? Yeah, um, you know, for whatever reason, uh, even as a kid when I was using my mom's Pentax, I loved shooting with black and white film. Um, I don't know, maybe it could come down to some of the skateboarding, you know, influence and seeing a lot of black and white photos and a lot of the documentary photos, um, especially early skateboarding. Uh, and then also music as well, seeing a lot of the sort of behind the scenes, a lot more documentary style, um, and also the history of photography. And, and as my sort of interests and, and, uh, you know, photographers that I was really admiring. Once that started to grow and, and seeing a lot of the classic photographers that I kind of resonated with, seeing that similar kind of, not necessarily similar style, but just seeing what it was I saw in my mind when I'm, you know, out looking at, at anything, looking for pictures, it would always in my mind be seen in black and white and and a lot of my early influences seeing that um i think part of the the film process as well um i used to develop color film as well but i rarely shot it in comparison to to black and white and so i think had i never gotten involved with shooting film or with developing film and printing in the darkroom that definitely could have you know changed a little bit of that for me i think that has a, a big part of it but even again back to as early as i can remember um seeing pictures and and kind of picturing them in my mind as black and white um for whatever reason it's just it's always made a better picture in my opinion when yeah. i see something in color um i can appreciate uh great color pictures and and photographers who work exclusively in color I think it really all comes down to what is going to suit that photographer the best. But I think there's part of me with my OCD and, and everything being a little bit quieter and in and, and terms of not necessarily as just, um, you know, eye gouging at times, I can, <laughs> the, the photographs feel a little bit more in line with how I see and feel. And, um, you know, in terms of, comparing it to color it's it's tough to say again because i think all of it is so so subjective but when i am looking at compositions and as i'm shooting trying to compose things eliminating any of that sort of contrary feeling that color can sometimes play eliminating all of that and just focusing on the shape and the content and and everything in the photo not necessarily look at this color, look how vibrant it is, or look how subdued the color is. Um, really focusing on just using the light to change the shape and, and composition of everything. Um, that, to me, I think has just always felt the most natural and, and sort of the closest thing to what I see in my mind 
uh, when I'm actually out looking. So now we know that Matt Day has a black and white brain and eyes. He only sees in black and white. So don't, <laughs> don't, don't present anything of color. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> um, Matt, is it the same idea behind the use of Leica cameras? I mean, they're so simple. I'm holding my M10 right now. It has one, two, three. It has three buttons. <laughs> like yeah. If you look at other cameras um, that we use too, I know we, we're, we're Fuji fans also, uh, you and I. But yeah. uh, but man, when I have the M10 or the M6 even, it's even better because there's no button. Right. There's only one and it takes a photo and the other one just adjusts the, the, the speed. Um, is it the same idea behind, behind it, simplifying it to, to a simple expression? Absolutely. I think uh, for myself, as much as I appreciate any sort of advancement in, in technology with, with cameras, you know, because I, I understand that there's a time and place for it, you know, um, something that has incredibly fast autofocus and tracking autofocus and, you know, all low light. There, there are all kinds of use cases where I know there are going to be photographers, especially working photographers who are going to be able to do their job better. Um, or, or do their job in a more efficient way, be able to work in different environments. There are a lot of things that I see that I fully understand the need and the time and place for certain things. For myself, if I'm, again, left to my own choices, my own, I can use any camera, I can go out and shoot anything with any lens. It, it's, it's really helpful for me personally to limit the possibility of distraction and weighing out my options like well i'm out with a 24 to 70 lens i got a 70 to 200 in the bag i've got a camera that can shoot you know eight frames a second and i can do xyz they're all un like unlimited possibilities now with so many cameras that most people if they're wanting to pursue photography, they will have access to incredible technology nowadays. And I think that's a great thing. There's that it's a, that's a big topic and, you know, kind of debate probably back and forth about sort of the accessibility of photography and what that's done to the industry and all of these things. To be perfectly honest, I couldn't care less about all of that. I think if someone wants to get into photography and now they're they have more access to those things it's a great thing i know what photography has done for me i know what it can do for other people it's great and when i'm choosing my own cameras though and and how i like to shoot the less distractions the less things i have to think about um you know buying my my m6 10 years ago It was a camera I wanted for so long. I saw, you know, Ed Templeton and and uh, you know Mike O'Mealy and and uh, Jerry Sue, like all of these different photographers that I had seen use those cameras at different times. It became one of those things that, you know, for whatever reason, at an early age in my head, I'm just like, oh man, one of those one of these days. I didn't even know why, but as a kid, I just thought like. All of my heroes are using these cameras. And uh, once I finally bought it and started using it every day, it really became just about not having to think about it. It was a camera that is so simple and so quick for me to use that it was the least resistance from you know seeing something and shooting. So for daily life, carrying a camera with me, something that kind of stays out of the way, that's always been appealing to me. And if I walk around with something that has all kinds of different modes and features and I can switch back and forth between all, all sorts of different styles, again, time and place. If I'm shooting a wedding, I want something that can keep up and I don't want to be you know, manually focusing every single thing for an entire wedding day. I would often kind of use a, a combination of the two. You know, I would have the M6 or, or a digital M Uh, also with me because there are moments where that is going to be the quick camera I'm going to want to grab for a specific thing. But if I'm, you know, shooting a bunch of formal portraits of the wedding party and all of the details, and I want to be able to focus closer than 0.7 meters, you know, there yep. again, t time and place. And so if I can eliminate any of the thoughts of, well, maybe I should have brought this lens today instead of this one. You know, I've, I've got two lenses that I have. I have a 35 Summicron and a 50 Summilux. And 
I have, you know, I could easily carry both of those lenses with me because they're so small and compact and doesn't take up much space. I could keep one in my pocket, but even then it's still too much sometimes for me in my head because I'm going, ah, oh, there, I could get a little bit closer and I can't physically move my feet closer. So maybe the 50 would help out a little bit or I'd get a little bit more compression out of there. Um, again, time and place. If I can just go out with the camera and focus on what's in front of me, the less changes I can make or need to make on the camera, on the lens, uh, that sort of stuff. It just, again, with my OCD and my anxiety and everything, all of the sort of second guessing, uh, stripping it down to that, it really kind of falls in line with how I like to shoot. I can definitely relate. And I think it's one of those you know, cameras that you have to hold in your hand and shoot it because you can, you can, you can bitch about it all, all day long. It's too expensive. This and that it's hyped right. up and stuff because of Matt day and you know, people like <laughs> us. No, I'm just kidding. Just kidding. Uh, but ultimately if you hold, I mean, for me, that, that was, that was how I got into the Leica ecosystem. I held one in my hand. I shot it for a couple hours and I'm like, Oh, okay. Now I get, now it. I get it. You know, like it's, 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 it's And, and I won't say that often, but stop watching my channel and Mad Day's channel and whoever's channel, you know, grainy day or grainy check, whatever. Go rent a M6, M10, whatever you're into. And then yeah. if it's and for a lot of photographers, it's not for them. They're like, no, no, no. It's to your point. It's, oh, it's not sure. it's not aligned with my what I'm trying to do and so on and so forth. And at the end of the day, who freaking care about what camera right. you shoot? We yes. happen to like these cameras at the end of the day. The product is, or the outcome, I should not say product, the outcome is photographs. That's what matters, you know. At the end of right. the day, we couldn't care less. But like when I saw Kurt Cobain play with a Fender Jaguar, I said, huh, let me look into that. Tried the guitar. Oh, man, okay. And Tony Hawk's, you know, skateboard, I guess a lot of people wanted to know what he was skating with, you know. Right. So so, so it's the same. So, so I think you have to enjoy the process. And the tool we use to create our stories in this day and age It is part of the process. It is part of the creative process, but it's it is not the process. I'm, right. I'm, I'm sure you could go back to that three megapixel camera and take take some very interesting photos that are you know aligned with what with the work that you do today. So so uh, people should stop thinking about what the what is the ultimate camera that that they should get. Although to go back to our earlier point, there is some advantages of having a monochrome sensor and. Uh, I look forward to seeing the the new series with the uh, the M11 mo monochrome because I think that man the M10 mono was already super good and in terms of the dynamic range and all this stuff um, don't blow those highlights though I don't know how it is on the <laughs> M11 mono but uh, I think now we've you know it's kind of the pinnacle of monochrome sensor and guess what there's no other camera brand that does a monochrome sensor last time I checked right unless there's one that you know that I don't, that I'm not aware of believe it or not oddly enough it was it was either the same day or the day before pentax released a oh, yeah, dslr right. yeah yeah with a with a it's it's an aps-c sensor uh monochrome i think it's k3 i mm -hmm. believe i've never used any of pentax's digital cameras okay. um I, so I can't say I know people love them and I've mm -hmm. <laughs> uh, the only reason I know so much or have heard so much about it is specifically because of people telling me that I could have just spent way less and bought the, you know, the K3 monochrome and yeah, but, gone on yeah. a trip. And I'm like, yeah, I, I absolutely could have, but I did not want to. Exactly, <laughs> that's, exactly. And that's just me, you know. And, um, and, and there's, it, there, there's a value in that form factor too. And also APS-C, I don't want to start a debate, but APS-C versus full frame. And, you know, there's a lot. And then Pentax versus Leica. At the end of the day, you make your own choices, you know. You don't you don't tell, exactly. hey, Picasso, you, should, you it, choose these brushes and stuff, you know, whatever. Right. When when people usually, you know, make any sort of comment or, or uh, saying anything like that i usually just say that's good you should do that then yeah you go know? ahead like, buy the pentax it, it, it truly, <laughs> report yeah, on it it truly <laughs> doesn't matter to me what anyone uses and i um you know people assume that i'm like on like as payroll or something because no. i i've been lucky enough to to you know share about new cameras as they come out and and talk about things and It's like I, at the end of the day, no matter how many people have told me, hey, I bought an M6 because of your video. Believe me, I wish I was making commission on that because yeah. if that were the case, 
I wouldn't have had to sell my M11 to buy the M11 <laughs> exactly. monochrome, you know. Um, but that's not the case. I I, I buy the cameras I, I want to use, and and I usually sell a camera that I was using before in order to fund that one because that's I know if I had a dozen cameras, the idea of well maybe I should bring this one, maybe I should bring that one. You know, I've I've gone down that road for myself, and I know that that does more harm than good for me because. Uh, I spend more time weighing out my options as opposed to just grabbing the camera and going. And but Matt, um, Matt, t- tell us the truth. So, so Molly still have that X100 though. So you have access to a Fuji camera. I do still have access <laughs> to the X100V. Yes, Molly does still have that. I, um, as a matter of fact, I used it a couple of weeks ago at her run club, um, <laughs> specifically. <laughs> and again, time and place. Yeah. I, I, I've got this M11 monochrome, and she's like, "Yeah, that's." the most you camera i think you've ever bought but she wanted color photos for her run club of <laughs> so course she was like, my today, whether you like it or not and i'm like yeah it's a great camera i love it and i'm sure you made good use of that autofocus also you know of manual course. focusing on the a run club uh, good luck yeah <laughs> yeah took full advantage of that i um you know a- again it's Cameras for me, whether it's a camera I'm trying out, you know, briefly or a friend is showing me their camera and I shoot a little bit with it, doesn't matter what make or what style, what year it was made. uh, Cameras are fun for me. And that's, again, part of, you know, sharing about it and talking about it. And, you know, I, I want to share and talk about the cameras I actually use because I want it to... I, I I want it to feel as much like me in the videos as I possibly can. And if I just had a, a regular sort of revolving door where every time a new camera came out, I was getting first look at every Sony or every Canon or every Nikon, whatever. Um, there are people that are going to do that on their channels and they would do it far better than I would anyway, because that's, that's not necessarily what I want to share. I want to share the cameras and and the tools that I use and only speak about why they work well for me and specifically how they wouldn't work well for other people. Because again, I know I, I say it all the time. I'm like, I would not recommend a Leica M camera to everybody like without a doubt, because I know it's not for everybody, not just in terms of pricing. I just mean the rangefinder experience using the Leica M uh, especially it's just all comes down to what you like to use and and you know you you brought up earlier like people asking about you know Tony Hawk's skateboard and what kind he would use you know there's a whole world of going into the very very fine details of perfecting your skateboard setup and i mean going down to fractions of an inch to the millimeter difference of you know what size wheel what size truck and and what's the wheelbase like how steep is the nose what's the concave like all of these different variables and people obsess and nerd out over it. And I find it fascinating to hear what my favorite skateboarder, what, how do they ride their trucks? Are they loose? Are they tight? Do they, you know, do they skate the nose? Do they skate the tail? There are all kinds of different things that they share because a lot of skateboarders love nerding out on that stuff. And I find photography and cameras the same way. It's not to say if you use this exact combination, you're not going to skate like that person. If someone buys the same camera as their favorite photographer, they're not going to take photos like their favorite photographer. Yep. But it is interesting, especially just for the sake of YouTube and conversation, to just share about it and talk about it. And and to the people who don't find that interesting, they should not be watching YouTube or or <laughs> listening to those conversations, you know? And that's again, I think time and place for everything. Um YouTube, especially because of the comments, there's, mm-hmm. there's a lot of noise there. And, yeah. uh, you know, I just, I, that's always what I'm trying to encourage people. I'm like, just seek out the, the information, the content, however you want to frame it, just seek out what you're interested in. And if it doesn't do anything for you, life is far too short to spend any time even thinking about it if it's yeah. not bringing you something you know completely agree and we uh, salute uh, Gerald and then uh, through uh, through the video yes <laughs> we i command his uh, consistency i'll put it this way on everything right. that's coming up and the uh, speaking of nerding out I, and he's a fellow canadian too so i remember watching his video at first and i was like 
he's he's just a machine like he 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 dives yeah. so deep and he explains every single thing and to your point there's a place for these type of videos there's also a place for you know there's there's videos that talk about the art of i mean what uh, ted forbes was doing for all ted those forbes, years yeah. right so the art of photography but it's the beauty of the internet guys you've got both you can listen to one right. to the other both of them you can make your own opinion you can even start your own channel like like Matt and I and who knows maybe you'll end up like Matt and uh, and making a living out of it which is again when i think about it and i follow you since day one so uh, seeing you evolve through all this <laughs> journey is so inspiring um, uh, at least uh, for me that. and I, i'm Thank pretty sure for a lot of a lot of listeners also um, Matt speaking of exciting stuff what's outside of a new camera what, what's next for you what, what's the what's the project you're working on what's what are the videos you're gonna you know uh, uh, grace us with uh, in the next few, yeah. uh, few months so um at the moment i am working on uh the the next i guess project would be uh the the book that i've been working on yes. over the last couple of years um i i wanted to make sort of a follow-up to my book friend of mine not necessarily uh Nothing too, you know, uh, tightly framed or, or boxed in necessarily, but just the the spirit of that book and that project really just came through as sort of me defending my hometown in a way and and showing that it is a small town and it's something that most people would not be interested in whatsoever, especially at the time when I made the pictures, which were 2013 and 14. Um, at that point. Chillicothe was very different from what it is today. And, um, you know, I, I wanted to share what I saw in Chillicothe, what I felt in Chillicothe. And it was, um, you know, a love letter in a lot of ways. And now having, uh, re-released the book, um, in 2021, which was something I had wanted to do. It was like when I originally released those, it was, you know, I used Blurb at the time, which was very different from even what Blurb is capable of now. And, you know, I, I put the pictures out as as many as I could, you know, copy wise and uh, tried to make it as, as the, essentially with the tools I had available to me. And ever since then, I've always, you know, in my head thought one day I want to revisit this and really make the book, you know, that I really wanted to a nice hardcover linen wrapped book with you know much better printing better paper just all around i mean better editing better sequencing from top to bottom i knew it wasn't what i always had in my mind in the in the original state you know but i think releasing it at the time and doing it the way i did it was another necessary step and part of that process and so i'm i'm grateful to have done it the first time but i i always knew I wanted to revisit it. And so after doing that, I thought, you know, I seeing these pictures and spending way more time with them than I had in previous years, because so much time had gone on. It made me think like, wow, Chillicothe has changed so much since I made these pictures. And I've changed so much, both in terms of, you know, photographic style, but also just as a person and as me understanding the, 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 city as it is and also just how i'm responding to things as i'm out looking and originally it was just let me take sort of a new look at chillicothe in this state and um you know spending time on it i think I, there's so much i think that comes down to just luck and timing and you know once i got started on the project it was at a really Uh, pivotal time for me where my mom who was battling breast cancer uh yeah her cancer was worsening and mm. we knew her time was was coming to an end and at that same point that meant that where we were living and and you know my brother and making sure he has proper care and the whole dynamic of everything was shifting entirely and we were also just now or, or just at that point realizing we were expecting our third child and so a lot we knew a lot at the same new, time yeah a lot of the yeah same time. there was a uh, new life coming in saying goodbye moving you know leaving 
the house that I grew up in, we moved out of. So there were, you know, close to 30 years aside from a few years after, you know, high school, um, where I was living in, you know, in town for a few years on my own. But coming back to that home uh, for me and my wife, and then us starting our family there, and then leaving that home and starting this new chapter with new life, um, everything was just coming at such a, you know, a, a really, it, it just felt like a whirlwind. That was the, the only way I could describe it at the time where there was just so much change happening. And sort of having my regular rituals of places I would drive to, to go and photograph. Often I'm, you know, in the truck by myself, just driving, pulling over and, and just looking a lot of looking by myself and having sort of the similar places that I would see and frequent every day from where we were living, still living in Chillicothe, but on the complete other side of the County and the the landscape shift and the different things I would see and pass by every day. And um, just realizing how much of my daily life was completely shifting from the perspective of a photographer, which has sort of always been how I interact with things. I'm always just mm. interacting with what I'm looking at. And yeah. um, it, it was initially set out with this very sort of shallow but th and, and thin layer of like, you know, I'm just going to make new pictures in Chillicothe and just see how it feels, how it goes, what's new, what's different. Um, and so much more right when I got started on it, it really became a lot more about my feeling as mm -hmm. I was going out and looking and, and a sense of home, you know, still in the same place, you know, more or less, but day to day, it, it was completely changing and, uh, you know, new life, new responsibilities, new, just new everything and kind of coming to figure out like what, what that really looks like for me, um, especially at that time and what it feels like. And, uh, um, it was very much more, I don't know the word necessarily, everything felt much more secluded and, and just mm. sort of private to yeah. me in terms of the things I was looking for and, and making pictures of. It was much less focused on the community and the people here where, you know, and, and friend of mine, there are people that, you know, I would meet and, and talk to and moments that it was about that shared experience, you know, with my other people in my community and my neighbors. And this whole project felt so much more, uh, you know, kind of secluded and, and, yeah. and to myself where, you know, there are no people in any of these pictures mm. and, and it's, it's a completely different feel. Um, as I kind of worked on that in the midst of, you know, moving and having another baby and all of these things, um, it's now basically in the process of kind of putting that together and, and threading it all together to, to share those feelings and those, those thoughts, you know? Um, and so that's been a whole other part of the process for me of, of, you know, I've gone out and looked and, and I've, I've let things just naturally kind of grab me. Um, it wasn't necessarily like, with friend of mine, I had an idea at least once I started realizing there was a, a thread there and I thought about the idea of putting them together. Um, you know, it wasn't like a shot list, but I, I knew there were characters in the landscape that, that would be part of the story. I knew there was, par there was specific things I needed in order for it to feel how I wanted it to feel. And with this project, it was very much more of like, I'm just going to let myself find it along the way. And regardless of what it is, what it looks like, I'm just going to indulge in whatever feels right in the moment. Because at that point, very few things felt right, I guess, yeah. you know, uh, I mean, things, things, obviously there were, there were beautiful and great things happening as well, but it just, so much of life felt very much out of my control or decision making it was just i'm a passenger right now you know i'm i'm just going through these things in life and taking it as it comes um and i tried to let just my natural instincts kind of 
kind of lead that. And so that's for, nice. yeah, for yeah. this book, yeah. that will be the next, you know, kind of project. Nice. And, um, I've had to take brief moments, uh, like kind of stepping away from it and just let my eyes refresh and adjust mm -hmm. and, and, uh, also just let my mind rest yeah. from, from a lot of it. And, um, so I, I haven't given myself any hard deadlines on it because I don't want to rush any mm -hmm. part of it, but, uh, the goal for sure is, uh, is this year to be printing that book. And then, um, you know, anything else that comes through there with, uh, the YouTube videos and things like that. Um, I, I'm not, I'm not necessarily, I wouldn't say I'm I'm the greatest content creator. I'll put it that way because I'm very much just whatever feels right in the moment. I'll go for that and yeah. just take it one week at a time, one upload at a time, and uh, just try to make sure I'm staying, you know, kind of close to the heart as much as I can. Well, I want to thank you for your generosity. I want to thank you for being so open, so honest about you know the process and everything. I'm sure a lot of people. Um, are with me on that one so I want to publicly thank you for all those you know, videos and this open art conversation uh, he is Matt Day of course um, on YouTube and also MattDayPhoto.com I really invite you to go see his work it's um, again I think you, you described it best feeling and open heart and also he shares a lot about you know the process of being a creative person that is a real human because sometimes again we tend to forget that we're humans after all uh, so if you want to give this uh, podcast a five-star review if you enjoyed the conversation today with matt please do so on apple podcast spotify or wherever you are listening to your podcast i've been fred ranger and you can find me at friendranger.com also at Fred Ranger on all the platforms, including YouTube, also doing my, my little my little space there, and also on all the other platforms. Matt, again, I want to thank you so much. You've been so generous, and I hope to talk to you soon. I feel like we could have this conversation every month, and there would be new stuff to share. I, 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 I feel this is the first of many conversations. So, Matt, thank you so much again. Thank you, Fred. It's It's been a pleasure, and uh, yeah, we'll definitely have to revisit this one again. Awesome. Cheers. Cheers.